Midweek Pictorial, April 8th, 1920. Towering Woolworth Building, Broadway, New York, tallest business building in the world. It has 57 stories and is 750 feet high. In front of it is the City Hall, photographed from Archway of Municipal Building. The majestic Capitol Building at Washington, one of the noblest architectural creations in the world, as seen from the West. In front is the beautiful Botanical Gardens. View of Washington looking toward the Northeast. The body of water is the tidal basin, and the building in the right foreground is the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. U.S. Surgeon General Cummings with assistance weighing Health Crusade children at Washington, in the movement now in full swing to assure stronger and healthier bodies for the coming generation. Thrilling moment in a baseball game at Columbus, Georgia between the Boston Braves of the National League and the Detroit Tigers of the American League. Hank Gowdy of the Bostons is reaching out to put the ball on a Detroit player who overslid the plate and was out. Bush, the shortstop of the Tigers, is shown with one hand in the air at the right. Umpire Finneran is seen deciding the play at the left. Ingenious advertising is not confined to printed pages, as is shown by this clever contrivance, which gives passersby a convenient place to sharpen pocket knives, and at the same time advertises the owner's shop. The sharpening stone is built into the concrete beneath the window, and can be used by the housewives of the vicinity to sharpen their kitchen utensils, so that the men are not the only beneficiaries. Wireless telephone outfit in the room of the House Committee on Military Affairs that connects committee with the War Department. The revolt of the Baltic troops in the environs of Berlin, while it created a sensation in Germany and throughout the world, was of short duration. It was apparent within 24 hours after its inception that it was doomed to failure. It was premature, having been hastened by the preparations of the Ebert government to arrest the ringleaders in the movement. In five days, the revolt had collapsed. The leaders fled and have not yet been apprehended, although their punishment is promised. The Ebert government is once more in power, and the disorders in the Ruhr district have been suppressed by the use of armed forces. Photo caption. Truckloads of barbed wire being rushed to strategic points in Berlin by Ebert government. Royalist soldiers in Munich who were in sympathy with the Cap Revolt are here seen searching an automobile on the Isar Bridge. The movement in Munich was short-lived and collapsed with startling suddenness. In the suburbs of Berlin, there were clashes between the Baltic troops who supported the Cap Revolt and the government forces. Troops of the Ebert forces are forming an impromptu barricade in Frankfurter Alley. Field kitchens and supply columns for the invading Cap forces, showing the old imperial flag, halting in the Wilhelmstrasse on the morning of the revolution. Unter den Linden, Berlin, Brandenburg Gate in background. Here, the invading Baltic troops first stopped and established strong defensive positions, supported by artillery. It was here that Berliners were first apprised that a counter-revolution was in progress. Soldiers of the Reichswehr drawn up at the town hall in Berlin. It is upon these forces that the Ebert government relies for the suppression of disorders in the Ruhr district. The Millennium Monument in Budapest, which suffered from the vandalism of the red terrorist attacks under the communist regime of Bela Kuhn. The monument, which was most impressive, had been erected to commemorate a thousand years of Hungarian history. In the spaces between the columns stood statues of Hungarian kings. Those of the later kings were overthrown and destroyed by the communists, and the pedestals on which they formerly stood can be seen in the picture. Bela Kuhn is now a fugitive in Austria, and demands for his extradition have been refused. Group of the new White Army that has been recruited by the reactionary elements that have now gained control in Hungary after the brief rule of the communists under Bela Kuhn. The army is recruited exclusively from the illiterate peasant class, which is supposed to be least affected by Bolshevism. They wear German helmets, on which is painted the Hungarian crown. Hungarian White Army being reviewed by Admiral Horty and his officers, who belong to the titled and Junker class. Horty, marked by cross, was chosen March 1st as protector of Hungary. He is strongly imbued with monarchical tendencies. 
British troops leaving a suspected Sinn Féin headquarters after a 15-hour search for seditious leaders and literature. It will be noted that the men are in full equipment and ready for instant service. The situation in Ireland, instead of abating, is daily growing more serious. One of the women arrested in a recent raid on the Sinn Féin, trying to argue with the policeman. Some of the women involved in the movement are more vehement and ardent than their masculine colleagues. Part of the devastated area at Melrose Park, a suburb of Chicago, where 40 square blocks were destroyed by a tornado and many lives lost. Seen at Elgin, Illinois after the cyclone had passed. The building whose wreck is here seen was formerly a four-story department store. Eight people were killed, over a hundred injured, worshippers and churches were crushed, and property damage wrought to the amount of four million dollars. A home near Chicago wrecked by the cyclone, type of hundreds of others that went down in the terrific storm that swept through several western and southern states on March 28th. At last accounts, nearly 200 lives were lost, and the stunned inhabitants have not yet been able to estimate the enormous property damage. Wreck of the First Congregational Church at Elgin, New York, that contained 1,000 worshippers at the time the crash came. The pastor had just concluded his sermon with the words, Be prepared, for you know not when you will be called, and was pronouncing the benediction, when with a roar the roof collapsed, killing three persons and burying a great many others in the debris. Brick buildings as well as frame were powerless to withstand the force of the tornado that swept through the western states, as can be seen from this wrecked store at Elgin, Illinois. One of the homes at Dunning, Illinois after the storm had wreaked its fury on it. The walls were torn away like so much paper, revealing the furniture in the various rooms. The twisting cyclone practiced strange freaks as it tore its way through the suburbs of Chicago. This house at 20th Street and Hamlin Avenue was decapitated, the roof being blown into an adjacent lot. The rapid spread of aviation in this country has led enterprising hotel managers to advertise the name of their hostelries on the roof so as to attract business from the flyers. This hotel is in San Francisco. One of the most powerful battleships in the world in course of construction is the North Carolina, which when completed will be the pride of the US Navy. She will have a tonnage of 43,200, with 12 16.5 guns and subsidiary batteries. She is being built at the Norfolk Navy Yard. Sea sled of 1,600 horsepower, with a speed of 55 miles an hour. These boats are used for carrying land airplanes to sea, the speed being so great that the airplanes can take off without a run. Review of the 63rd Infantry Regiment, USA, the military unit that has been chosen to guard the national capital. The review is taking place in the space before the majestic building. The choice of a regiment for this purpose is regarded as a signal honor to the unit chosen. Part of the estate on the Massachusetts coast where President Wilson will spend the summer. Allied troops parading in Jerusalem during the victory celebration. The march was participated in by both British and French troops, and the population turned out en masse to watch and in many cases to applaud. The Turkish spectators naturally found little to please them in the spectacle, but for the mass of the throng it was a symbol of national deliverance. Men and women in a German factory salvaging leather from old army shoes, leather cases, and articles of all kinds, in order that the work may help in relieving the great shortage of leather in Germany. When the war came to an end with unexpected suddenness, there was an enormous amount of leather goods, boots, straps, belts, etc. that had been manufactured for army use that was no longer required. Some had been only partly used, and the material was in sufficiently good condition to justify saving it and transforming it to other uses. An event attended with many elements of mystery occurred recently when upon unloading the U.S. shipping board freighter West Hepburn at San Francisco, it was found that $75,000 worth of cottonseed oil and peanut oil that had been put on the boat at Kobe, Japan, had been destroyed. Out of a total of 14,800 cases of oil, 5,000 cases had been crushed and punctured by stevedore's bail hooks. It is thought to be a case of sabotage. Damaged cases are here seen. 
Mademoiselle Lucille Bataille, Queen of Queens of the Carnival at Paris, leaving the Elysee Palace, the French White House, after she had been received and congratulated by Paul de Chanel, President of the Republic. One of the floats that attracted marked attention in the Paris Carnival. It represented French resources in food and drink, and besides specimens of French products, was elaborately garlanded with flowers and adorned with a bevy of beautiful girls chosen for charm and vivacity. One of the grotesque features of the carnival was a float that parodied the great French railway strike that had just ended in a pronounced victory for the government. Various makeshifts such as bicycles and carts were shown as substitutes for railway carriages, and the float was drawn by horses on which postillions were seated, while clowns on the float itself diverted the throngs by their antics and contortions. The shortage in housing and the growth in population have sent the figures for rent to dizzy heights. That part of this increase is justified by increased taxes and heavier costs in repairing and maintaining the buildings is generally acknowledged. But public indignation has been aroused by the greed of many landlords, who believe in putting on all that the traffic will bear. In many cases, rents have doubled, sometimes trebled, and the situation has become so acute that bills have been prepared in the New York legislature which declare that a public emergency exists that impairs the freedom of contract, and that therefore the increase of rent shall be limited to 20 or 25 percent. Any further increase throws the burden of proof on the landlords, to show before a court that the increase is justified and reasonable. There is every prospect that the bills will be passed and immediately become law. In the meantime, heart-rending scenes of eviction are becoming common, tenants are threatening direct action, and the situation is undeniably serious. Photo Caption Rent Strike in Douglas Street, East New York The furniture of the tenants who have been evicted has been covered to protect it from the weather. Rent strikers gathered on sidewalk before a tall tenement row placarded with strike notices. One of the pathetic scenes that are all too common in the present desperate stage of the housing and renting problem. The aged woman in the cold street is keeping watch over her pitiful belongings that have been thrown out of her former home. Furniture of an evicted tenant thrown into the street because the owner was unable to meet the exorbitant increase in rent. In some cases, this increase has amounted to 100%. Tenants in the same building have gone on strike, on the theory perhaps that there is strength in numbers, that benevolent magistrates may help them curb the landlord, or that there will not be enough marshals to evict them. Famous old Butmi tree in Jerusalem, which was uprooted and thrown down in the recent blizzard that swept the city. The tree, which is of unknown age, was one of the landmarks of the place, and in pre-war days had been used by the Turks as a gallows. A tradition ran that when the tree should fall, it would mark the end of Turkish domination, and in order to avert this fate, the Turkish authorities had the tree propped with poles, and bound with iron. It has fallen, however, and so has Turkish rule. The Mosque of Omar, one of the chief Mohammedan structures of Jerusalem, surrounded with snow to an extent that has probably not been equaled in centuries. Narrow snow-covered street in Jerusalem leading to the Mosque of Omar. The houses at the left have latticed windows, through which the Muslim women used to peep unobserved in the days when the Turkish yoke still lay heavy on Palestine. The Wailing Place of the Jews in Jerusalem, with British soldiers more than knee-deep in snow. It is a most unusual thing to have snow in the Holy City, but on February 9th snow began to fall, and continued for three days and nights without cessation. Many buildings collapsed, train service was paralyzed, and in the surrounding country, sheep and cattle perished by thousands. Applicants for American citizenship receiving their final citizenship papers at the Bureau of Naturalization in New York City. All types of foreigners are represented from the various countries whose human output is sent here to the great melting pot of the nations. The second or third generation of these newly made citizens will have completely assimilated into the great American family. Swearing in an applicant for American citizenship at the New York Bureau of Naturalization during the application for second or final papers. Each applicant has to be accompanied by two witnesses, who are also sworn. As can be seen, the clerks are kept busy in attending to those who are thus inducted into American citizenship. 
The applicants are required to renounce all previous national ties and to swear loyalty only to America. Automobiles employed in drawing tram cars in Appledorn, Holland. Formerly, the cars were drawn by horses, and progress was so slow and unreliable that many of the citizens preferred to walk. Since the installation of the new system, however, the cars are well filled during business hours. Reindeer raising is a new industry in Alaska, but already the little herd of these animals that the US imported from Asia some years ago has multiplied so greatly that four packing plants will be built this year to ship reindeer meat to the states. Part of the herd is shown. Novel team of camels being used by a farmer near Macon, Georgia to draw his loads. The animals were the property of a circus wintering at Macon. Wives of cabinet members and other officials doing their own marketing in Washington to help reduce the cost of living. President Carranza, central figure of first row, in conference with governors of Mexican provinces, who recently met with him to make plans for the forthcoming Mexican elections in July.